Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Disc Golf Answer Man. I am Bobby Cool, Daddy Slick Breeze. And on this episode, I have a conversation with Scott and Amanda from Flight Tower. You may remember from a previous episode where I had a conversation with Jesse from Trash Panda Disc Golf. They had mentioned Flight Tower as someone that I needed to meet and someone I needed to talk to. So I reached out to them and they were excited to be on the show. I wanted to learn a little bit more about Flight Tower, what, uh, what is the Flight Tower all about, and also about his business and what he does as far as running his business and where he's gone from the beginning to where he is now. So let's take a listen. Well, hello, Amanda and Scott. How are you guys doing today? Good. Doing great. Thank you. Awesome. I appreciate you guys coming on the show. Um, I've heard of Flight Towel. I've actually held a Flight Towel in my hand, but I've never actually talked to you guys to figure uh, find out about your business. And so that's one of the things I want to do with the Disc Golf Management Podcast, learn more about businesses that are out there that have that are in the disc golf world. So I appreciate you coming on the show. And so I, we can just jump right into it, really. It's like, when and where did you come up with the concept of Flight Towel? Well, for me, I was uh, I got into disc golf from ball golf. Uh, I have some major back issues and I really enjoyed playing ball golf, but at some point it was just too much on my back. That rotation, I couldn't handle it. So my brother-in-law was like, Hey, come play disc golf with me. Never even heard of it. So gave it a shot and uh, I really loved everything about it. You know, after I got those first few throws in and you actually see the flight pattern of a disc and how it's supposed to fly, you know, pretty much hooked me right there. But the thing I was missing and the thing that I always had to do in ball golf was warm up. You know, you can do this practice swings in ball golf. So I needed something to mimic that in disc golf. And that's where I came up with the flight doll product. I looked up the towel routine, kind of started doing that, but it didn't feel right to yeah. me because it wasn't a disc in the hand. And it, it just, it, it'd be like warming up uh, in ball golf with just a stick instead of your club. You know, it just, it just wasn't right. Yeah. And so that's where I, uh, I came up with putting the fob, which is just a cut up piece of a disc onto a towel and then sewing that little pocket into the bottom so it catches some resistance as you pull it across and warm up. So it's not just open on the arm, it's actually pulling back a little bit. So, and oh, no, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, we had just kind of fallen in love with disc golf and we went oh, yeah. to um, our big, big uh, BSF. Um, yeah, Beaver State, Beaver State Plain, Plain yeah. in, in Oregon up at Milo. And um, it was, you know, we just loved being a part of the disc golf industry. And we're like, okay, we got to do something. We got to be here next year. We got to have our own product. And so it was all kind of happened in the same timeline. Um, and he had like this little tiny section that he was working out in our shop, you know, like making the first couple of flight towels. Yeah, and I think I had like a six foot by eight <laughs> foot area out in the garage and I'm, I'm trying to use the limited tools I had at that yeah. point in that small, small little space, you know, to make the first prototype and stuff. Yeah. But. And then, you know, he used it. I wanted one. Our friends wanted one. I'm like, we just have to do this. <laughs> we got to start yeah. making these and selling them. <laughs> so how did you talk to, to kind of talk me through the whole prototype stage? Like, how did you figure out how much of a disc that you would need and, and that whole process? I, I just kind of looked at my hand and figured it's kind of an average size hand. So I just wanted to grip the disc. And uh, my my first disc golf disc was a Franklin disc. And so <laughs> that one was the one that got cut up because after I threw an end of a disc, I no longer threw the Franklin disc. <laughs> yeah. uh, so that, that's the one that sacrificed itself for the first ever flight towel. But yeah, I just, I put my hand on it and just kind of traced it out. And uh, I came up with a little jig to be able to cut it out on a router instead of a bandsaw because I value my finger. <laughs> uh, and so that made it repeatable, coming up with a jig to be able to cut it out. And I, I figured out I could get four per disc. And yeah, that's how so the fob came did you have experience? Did you already have experience working with machinery like this? Uh yeah, I've, I've worked with tools all my life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my dad had always had a workshop and he was really big into woodworking and uh, just making these these cool little items that, you know, they're just one offs, but they were just for him to either hang a tool up or, you know, to improve mm -hmm. on a tool and stuff like that. So I'd, I'd always been around that for my entire life. So when the product didn't exist, I there was no doubt in my mind that I could come up with something that would work for me. You know? yeah, yeah, he just made it. <laughs> He's like, let's that's, figure it out. That's awesome. Now, okay, so you've, you've, you've used your hand. You figure out kind of how much you need of a disc. 
um, was the first one you made, was it like, this is it? Or how many iterations did you have to go through before you said, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to use from now on? Uh, it was, there was pretty much just two iterations. The first one was with a rectangular towel. So that had to change to a square towel to have mm. everything even as you're pulling through. And the first one, I didn't have the exact shape of the top of the fob done. Um, it was a little bit weird looking. Uh, so, but version number two, which came probably a week later after, you know, testing the first one out there on yeah. the course a few times, nice. version number two stuck. And well, then, uh, yeah. And I think, you know, modification on support, the support piece that he uses yeah. now. Um, that came in version two as yeah, well. Yeah. If, if you notice, did you got the ones that we had sent, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. I got them right here. So that, that little plastic support piece, that was pretty big because if that doesn't oh. go in on that, on that fob there, it's, you probably get like a month out of it and it's just going to rip out of the plastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so I that mean, came into version two as well. And then at one point you asked me, and we're kind of jumping around here, but it just popped in my head. But when I asked you to be on the show and you said you're going to send this to me, you asked me what I like to throw. And I'm assuming that as you started making this, that became very important because people like, I mean, we all know as disc offers, different discs feel different in our hand. And so was that something you discovered? Um, down the road that people are going to be particular about which disc they use? Or is that something you thought, you know what, I bet you people are going to want different discs? Well, yeah. It and was pretty much right away. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we had the product. I put the website together myself right off the bat. Uh, and then the first thing is, do you have it in a destroyer? Do you have it in a mm -hmm. T-Bird? <laughs> do you have it in a Sheriff? You know, and so that right away, I'm like, <laughs> oh, man, I'm going to have to get a lot of discs to be cutting up. Yeah. Well, and it's because it's not just about warming up your arm. It's also about getting the feel of the disc that you typically like to throw off the yeah. pad. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's getting that grip used to it. It's, it's letting it pull out of your hand, you know, having the feel of your most favorite disc yeah. on the tee pad at the same time. It just helps mimic the whole warm up routine. So you're really ready when you go grab that same disc. And some people just love the colors uh, and some people, you know, really go for the, the mold of the disc. Yeah. If you haven't had a chance to try out class discs and you're looking for a deal, maybe a discount to try out some discs, make sure you check out classdiscfactory.com. This is a store I've set up. They're sending me misprints from Finland and I'm putting these online at classdiscfactory.com. And that way you can try out some class discs at a great deal. Or if you already have fallen in love with the plastic and the feel from class discs, you can get your hands on a few more of your favorite molds. So make sure you check that out at classdiscsfactory.com. All right, so you decided you want to be part of the disc golf and the disc golf industry. You've got this product uh, in your mind that you can make. What were some of the challenges, though, starting out a uh, business from scratch? Uh, the biggest one is I wanted to do it debt-free. Uh -huh. And so that's, that's pretty hard to do. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you really have to start small and you slowly do, yeah. grow and be okay with growing at a smaller rate or, you know, adjusting as you get bigger instead of having like this huge lump sum and just like shoving it towards this new product and everything. So it's that may or may not work. That may or may not work. You know, right. It may not be popular. So it may not sell, it's know. really, um, you know, a bootstrapping type strategy. And so that can be a little challenging when you have to just incrementally grow, but it's, mm -hmm. it was also very, um, integral to i think our success yeah. yeah it was definitely worth it I, I started off here in oregon we have a can deposit and so i took cans back and started it with 50 bucks because i don't want to take any money out of the household income you know yeah. like this had to be the side project <laughs> and so i got started with 50 dollars. yeah <laughs> i think that's awesome that's very impressive because yeah a lot of people will tend to just get the credit cards or the business loan and just jump right mm -hmm. into it uh before they have a proven product uh, so i think that's a great that was a great approach for sure so how did you go once you got the product going how did you go about finding your first customers it wasn't hard <laughs> our, <laughs> our friends were like i want one i want one you know because we had disc golf for friends yeah friends and family and then you know we were we were kind of starting out in disc golf and our personal disc golf as well yeah. you know so we're starting out in that so we're starting to hit tournaments and we got into some met some really cool tournament directors yeah. they're like yeah i'd love to put one of those in my players back yeah I'm like well how many do you need we need 72 i'm like there's no way we can make 72 of these <laughs> <laughs> 
Because <laughs> they're but all handmade. You know? Yeah, they're all made by hand. I'm like, wait, wait, I got this six by eight little area I'm working <laughs> on here. You want to? Woo. But yeah, that's, that's kind of how it started. And then just word of mouth locally. And, and our team. We, our team, yeah. I mean, as soon as you make a disc golf product, you're going to have people that want to be on your team. Mm. Yep. It's just going to happen. And so we started growing our team locally yep. and then we started opening our team up each year um, to, to go more and more further out. Um, and so really, you know, the help of them to featuring our products and being out on the course and talking to other people uh, really helped us with kind of grassroots marketing. And then we slowly kind of tapped into some social media marketing. Okay. Now, when yep. you did, now you said you mentioned that you had the people come up and say, "Hey, we want seventy some odd, you know, for our players' package." How did you ta tackle that? Did you did you have to turn people away, or did you have to just uh, bear down and start producing all of them? You yeah. just get it done. <laughs> You're like, <laughs> okay, we'll do that. Yeah, and then we figure it out. You know. No, I mean, we still do that. We'll have somebody that I think I, mean, I just heard I Amanda <laughs> uh, talking to somebody that wants an order like in, in half the time days. it would. Yeah. usually take us and we're like let's just try to figure out how to get it done so yeah, yeah. any of those big orders you know, those huge hurdles you just buckle down you put the work in yeah. and you get it done and it works out yeah. that's awesome that's awesome now what are some of the as early on or even now what are some of the big, biggest mistakes have you made but then learn from Mm, I would say mm. some of the mistakes we made on the manufacturing side is subcontracting work out. Okay. Um, yeah. Like uh, we, we brought in all of our screen printing in-house. We bought all of our own equipment. And it, it's not because we didn't have a good relationship with our existing screen printer. Right. But they have other customers. And we needed to be somebody's top priority. So mm -hmm. we figured, hey. Let's buy all this equipment. Let's yeah. do it ourselves. We're always going to be our top priority, so we can do those rush jobs and things like that. Yeah, we did improve this. Improve our customer service. Yeah, we did the same thing with our vinyl. We brought vinyl yep. printing in, which is a much smaller part of what we do, um, but it, it at least gives us the opportunity to have access to that and do it as we need it. So I think that made a big difference for us. Yeah, so I'd say one thing is uh, it's, it's always nice to start out and let somebody else do part of your project, but as soon as you can, try to take control of that and bring it in house. Yeah, your, I mean it's going to save you so many Time, headaches, money, yeah. headaches, all yep. of those things. Yeah, nice. Sure. That's, that's, that's interesting. So, you outsource some stuff, and then once, but the, once you uh, the demand got higher, you felt you brought it in house. But what I would assume maybe that would bring a whole other set of challenges of having that machinery in house, and then uh, maybe learning how that stuff worked. Yeah. How did you work through that? Was it just another one of those just got to get in YouTube and learn it? Uh, basically, yeah. So there are two of us here, uh, but there are three other owners. people and three other owners in Flight Tal. Oh, okay. And uh, one of our owners, Scott West, uh, said, I'll do the screen printing. So we took his garage, turned it into a shop, and then he's like, I'm just going to learn it. I'm like, cool. Oh do it and he did you yeah. know and that's and yep. it was a definitely definitely a learning curve so you know screen printing isn't easy you can't just walk in there yeah. and like, oh, let's <laughs> screen print these towels yeah got it and you know he's trying to get help from people he's like yeah i'm screen printing on microfiber towels and like yeah i've never done that i don't know what to tell you yeah so, so it was all new yeah it was all new to him but yeah he just stuck with it and a lot a lot of late nights for him but he got it down and yeah it's definitely worth it now yeah. But that's just kind of what we do with everything. We figure it out on the fly, and we just make it work. That's what entrepreneurs you gotta do. Got to have some grit, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I love it. I love it. Now, as as you mentioned, you know, as an entrepreneur and as you're building this business and all these different facets come in, how do you stay motivated to keep going and keep doing this? I I love the work. I love being in disc golf. Uh, I. I mean, I absolutely love playing disc golf. My back doesn't allow me to do that as much as I would like. Yeah. So by working in flight towel and just being in the disc golf industry every single day, it just makes it awesome. That just keeps me motivated all the time. I get to do what I love. You know, I'm in the industry that I love. Yeah. 
And on top of that, for me, being in the industry of disc golf is, is fantastic. You know, getting, I do a lot of the, the sales and the sponsorship aspects. So our sponsorship team and doing wholesale and tournament sales. Um, and so I enjoy talking with other entrepreneurs because I've always been very entrepreneurial myself, having my own coaching business for 10 years, transitioning into this. I'm a little bit of a rebel, rebellious spirit. I like to make things happen. I like to do it now. And um, that kind of <laughs> personality is much more geared towards having your own business because it gives you, for me, it gives me a lot of um, variety in what I'm doing and the ability to have um, freedom, you know, freedom in your own business. It may be a lot of work, but it's still, you still have the access to switch and change and, and shift around as needed. And for me, that's what I love about having our own business, but also getting to work with my husband is pretty amazing too. No, I think um, that's cool. So yeah, it's, it's just a great win-win because we work really well yeah. together and, um, getting to share our business together is pretty, pretty amazing. Now, does that ever, even though it's great, I'm, it's great to be able to work with your partner, but does that ever present its own set of challenges as well? Mixing the personal and business life together, or are you able to separate that pretty well? I think it's all mixed together anyway. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, we work at home, we play disc golf together. We've yeah. been married for 23 plus years. So yeah. it's, um, we've been through it for long enough that it doesn't really, there's not really much of a separation, you know, <laughs> we'll be yeah. making dinner talking about business. I'm like, oh, <laughs> okay. And you know, <laughs> and with, and when you're working with somebody and, and we both work in Flytel, both live in the same house. Both visioning. It's you, you got to work it out where you got to realize who's good at what too, because yes. everything is pretty much work in life, you know, whether it's flight towel or sweeping the floors or doing the dishes or whatever. Yeah. So you just kind of find like what you're good at and not yeah. feel guilty if, you know, maybe Amanda is working on something in the house during the morning and I'm out here doing flight towel stuff or vice versa, you know, you yeah. just, everything's just broken up into chores and who's good at what. And yeah. Everything's work, you know, yeah. just bring it all together and balancing as much as possible. Um, but yeah, I think we've been lucky enough to not really have any issues separating that. I mean, sometimes we'll be up really late talking. We're like, okay, we're done talking about business. <laughs> we have <laughs> yeah. to like tell ourselves that sometimes, you yeah. know, but. Um, but it's really fun for both of us. Yeah. We really enjoy doing it. So. And we enjoy talking about. Often it doesn't feel like work. Yeah, exactly. And, and you know, that kind of comes to the, the, the mm -hmm. saying that if you find something you love doing, it never really feels like work except for when you're like working your butt off, it does, but <laughs> it's still, you know, at least you get to enjoy what you're doing and you have this beautiful buy-in, you know, when it's your own company. Now, uh, where are you at right now as far as sales, as far and you know, I don't not necessarily need to know numbers or anything like that, but like f walk me through a timeline of going hmm. from just your first few sales to where you're at now, w what's going on with the company? Gosh, yeah. I remember when we had like our first thousand dollar day. I'm like, oh yeah. my what gosh, this it yeah. could never be better than this. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, yeah, and then this year we're in GBO. Yeah, and we're, yeah, the glass fell and open. Oh, we're going awesome. over to Europe, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, but uh, so yeah, the, the first sales, those are always kind of scary because the sale happens, then you usually make the product at that point uh, yeah. because you always feel like you're behind. But the biggest thing was just scaling it and, and kind of keep it. And that's the thing too. If you can only grow it by rolling money back into the company, it grows a lot slower. So you can kind of prepare yourself for yeah. that growth instead of just pouring a bunch of gas on it. And yeah. Hoping that you're going. The and right so right. going slowly allowed us, like we started here, my little area, I was just working on it. Amanda had a full-time job uh, outside the home. And then uh, she started coming on on it, you know, kind of part time. And then we got Scott West involved, Grant, and Grant Nixon and Candace Sharp. And what we ended up doing is like this is this used to be our garage, and we turned it into a shop. Yeah, you, know, oh, you can't pull wow. a car in here. The garage door on the front is decorative because walls have been built, things like that. Hmm. And so turn this into my shop. Yep. Uh, we did the same thing for Grant and Candace 
Grant Nixon and Candace Sharp, they do our sewing, they do all of our towels. And so we built a shop at their house. And so they get to work from home too, which is awesome because they just had a little baby. So uh, wow, yeah, that's, that's awesome. That they get to be stay at home, mom and dad and work and all yeah. that. And the same thing with Scott West. Uh, he was already a stay at home dad and he, he wanted something to be a part of and to work on. So we're like, yeah, let's do the screen print in your place. So yeah, we have three shops uh, kind of spread out yeah. you know, over, over probably 30 miles. Yeah. So there, so there, how many, so how many total do you have in the flight towel company, I guess? There's just five of us. There's five of you and all of you yep. are working other jobs or this is the full, how many is this is the full time? This is full time for all of us now. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. That's so, so we that's just grew it slowly over the five years. We grew it slowly to the point that we could all just bail on our other jobs and just move into flight tell. And uh, yeah, that was a big, just, it's that worked was, out great. Yeah. That was a big moment for us to be able yeah. to like sustainably support, you know, three full families yeah. um, to be able to do it full time. It's pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. As you're so, talking about progression. I think that's amazing. So tell me how, uh, what are some of this, if you, if I don't know if you can narrow it down to like one or two or three step or three points, but what do you think made this a success or is making this successful? I think courage is a really big one. Yeah. You know, being willing to continue to step into the most uncomfortable parts of business that you yeah. maybe don't know and trying to figure it out and just having that, um, tenacity to continue moving through that uncomfortable feeling that you get because there's always something new coming that would, that's one of the biggest things i think um is really relatable for success in business is just having the courage to continue to do the work it's easy to talk about it it's easy to tell people about your vision and all that but to do the work is not always easy, especially when it's uncomfortable and it's something you're learning and you yeah. have to grind through that uncomfortable position. And that's the biggest thing for me is, is the drive. You know, I, there's yeah. nobody telling me that I need to come out here and, and make a hundred flight tell fobs mm -hmm. in know, one day. That's, that's on me. You know, you have <laughs> yeah. to have that drive to want to do it, to want to make it successful. Yeah. Yeah. Those Talk a little bit more about those. Un tell me a little bit more about those uncomfortable moments. What What were some moments that were uncomfortable? Uh, for me, <laughs> um, learning QuickBooks online was mm -hmm. lots of tears for that. I mean, it was like <laughs> so challenging, like those things that you just don't want to do, but they are a part of business. Um, that was though for me personally is something like uh, would be <laughs> QuickBooks online. Um, but um, you know, we're just always getting questions and new partnerships that are coming up. And so that's, you know, when you haven't done those things, um, it can be a little scary, you know, like, well, what do we do? What do we say? How do we want to move forward? And so being able to open up those conversations and be okay with that, I think, um, can be really uncomfortable too, you know, and having to come up with new policies or a new direction as a company, which way you want to go, what do you want to say, you know, I think that can be uncomfortable. How about yeah. you? I, I don't know. I don't get very uncomfortable. <laughs> well, lucky you. very confident. <laughs> yeah, I lucky know. you. I am. I think, yeah, I guess so. I think I'm just missing that part. <laughs> I carry I carry enough for both of there us. There we go. <laughs> well, I can totally relate to you on the uh, learning stuff as far as QuickBook stuff. I, I, I just finished uh, well, a couple of days ago with all my taxes, because last year was my first year of not being employed, of just, you know, having clients for yep. social media. And it was my first full year of submitting my taxes as self-employed. And I tell you what, even <laughs> I, I, I miss the days where I just hand the, the, the tax guy my uh, my forms and let him do everything. Um, but yeah. trying to figure it all out by myself is, was definitely uh, I, it was frustrating, but I finally got it taken care of. But uh, it seems like uh, there's. you were mentioning how you weren't sure how to answer this. You weren't sure how to say things or do this or move. It kind of goes along with Je what Jesse mentioned in his, in, in his interview was you don't know what you don't know, but it sounds like it, it, it's just one of those you got to figure it out. And you got to fail, yep. or you, you got to, and then and shift and move if it didn't work and, and, and try to figure it out on your own. Is 
even though you've had this success, you've got five people working full time. I'm assuming you're still learning new stuff every day, right? Every day. Yeah, that's yeah. the fun part. <laughs> it is. It's fun, exciting, scary, all at the same time. Excitable, exciting. Yeah. yeah. Every day, there's something new that comes through. I would say pretty much every day. It is like we uh, Amanda had just recently signed a deal with the Disc Golf Pro Tour for us to advertise on the Elite Series. Yeah. Oh, nice events. So. so uh, big. Yeah, and that was really big, and they're like, "Yeah, we just need your 30 second commercial." Okay. I'm like what? <laughs> sure. What do you mean? Of course, seconds? we'll send that right away. Uh, yeah, give us a week or so. Yeah, you know. I've never made a commercial before, so uh, yeah. But instantly, I'm like, "All right, how do I get this done? Let's just do it. Tell Let's them yes. It. <laughs> That's and fantastic. Just get it done. So yeah, in the last month, I've had to learn how to cut and uh, edit and put together yep. a commercial and sync it up with the audio yep. and learn that you can't just use audio. You have to buy, yes. you have to buy audio. Yeah. You have, to pay. Uh, yep. have your you licenses gotta... in check and have your, yeah, your model releases in there. Model releases. That, you know? that so, was new. Yeah. But yeah, I just, it was a challenge. I, and anytime I'm hit with a challenge like that, I don't know, that just lights me up. I get going and that's where I absolutely love it. It's just learning something new, something that I haven't done before. Yeah. Because once you do that, you gain the confidence to move into the next thing, you know, so more that the more uncomfortable we are, the more we have to learn and grow and be okay with things shifting and moving and adjusting, um, the easier it becomes. But it's definitely not easy in the beginning yeah. for most of us. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> All right. So let, let me ask some questions about specifically yep. about the, t the tech behind the towels, because I didn't know or I hadn't paid attention about the, the pocket in there for resistance. What was that again? Was that something else that you had to learn as you went or you were automatic or were like, I need some something to create some sort of resistance as you're practicing your form? That came in between version one and version two. Okay. Uh, I had to have some resistance because I was using it. It felt like I was going to pull my shoulder out when I was really giving it a, a good pull across my chest to try to, you know, hit that pocket. Yeah. And so that came in pretty quickly. Uh, I had to have resistance. It's and you know we've we've talked to a lot of therapists that physical therapists. you know physical therapists that are having their disc golfers that are patients use our product you know because of that resistance because it's not just empty weight coming through real quick like that it yeah. actually pulls back yeah so yeah that pocket and then to create the pocket Amanda had a sewing machine that I had never used before in my life so i just <laughs> put it down on the table and i'm like all right time to learn how to sew show me how okay and here's then, the basics <laughs> yeah she showed me some basics i'm like all right and then just learned it and yeah. uh <laughs> that's awesome and then the next one we have has the little carabiner on it what was the how, what was the inspiration mm -hmm. behind putting that together okay yeah the flight tile junior so here in Oregon, you have to have a towel to play a disc golf round. It's mandatory, right? Uh, and so I started out, I mean, I have a cart now, but I started out with a nice bag when I was playing. And I would always hang my towel from my bag, and it's it's hanging like this. And that's that's a lot. That's right? what you yes. find. And so by the end of my round, my towel is disgusting, the bottom of my bag's disgusting, and so is my back because I would throw it up on every time, and then it you know, just gets mud all over me. So I'm like, why is, and so I hit online, you know, I'm looking online, mm -hmm. why is there not a towel that's hung from the center and there wasn't anything out there? And so that's where I, mm -hmm. we came up with the Flight Tile Junior. Yeah, and we, we also wanted to be able to use all of our products as much as possible. So we actually, the, the centers of mm -hmm. our minis like and our juniors mm -hmm. are actually cut out of the flight plate of all of our discs that we use. And our discs are, you know, seconds and thirds. Uh, for manufacturers, usually overweight mm. that couldn't be used any other way. So, yeah, yeah, so it all worked out really well. That's what we're cutting those washers out because that's what's left over. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, just just yeah. to me. And uh, when I was before the interview, I was looking at your website and I learned about this and the reason why you put it in the middle. And I thought 
a genius because there are times where I look down. At, I looked. I would have my towel, like you said. Normally, they put it. They put the little hole in the corner, and my towel mm-hmm. would be dragging, and the bottom of my towel would be have grass all over it and dirt all over it because yes, it just that's the first thing. One of the first things that just sits down on the ground when you put your bag down. So I thought yeah. that was that was brilliant. And then of course using the the leftover disc uh, plastic to create those to hold on to it. The washer I think is fantastic. Okay, so then the other one, the the uh, the I think this is is this called the mini or yeah, yeah. With, mini yeah yeah. What's the thought behind the mini? So there's a lot of uh, players. If you'll notice, either if it's raining, they go up to the tee pad, they're covering their disc, you know, keep it dry, um, and or uh, they like to have the towel in their offhand, and you'll see them throw it on the floor or on the ground. And so, um, yeah, really, like you can just cinch this to your wrist. And then you don't have to throw it on the ground or you can, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, it's the same size as our original. It's, it's the 16 by 16 about, um, and they're also really helpful to kind of put in your pocket to keep your hand dry. And so we're kind of like looking for other typical uses of a towel, you know, like when we're out there, like how, how do we want to use this? Yeah. And it also has about the same distance for, um, as, that junior. as the junior. So you can hang it on, on your bag, even a trooper bag, and it's not going to, a smaller trooper bag, and it's not going to drag yeah. on the ground either. So. And then for me on this one, it's, yeah. I don't like going up to the tee pad like this, and we're in Oregon, uh-huh. you know, and yeah, I get really moderate. tired of that. And so I'm just standing there like this the whole time, and it's right over it, and it's got my dry spot, and then I just slip my hand in there, and I can drive. Yeah. And yeah. That's so fantastic. that's the thought behind that mini. And then, so this is a, so your towel is a little different because I can see it's got the little, the, uh, I guess that's the microfiber or what, what is the purpose of the little squares? How it's kind of like got some texture so it's to a, it. It's a waffle weave microfiber towel. There's the word, waffle times, weave, yep. Yeah, it holds seven times its weight in water. But the thing with those little waffle weaves in there is it's meant for cleaning glass. That's the one we had fun because we went through a lot of towels too. You know, not just when yeah. we were coming up with a fly towel, but just as disc golfers when we were starting out. <laughs> you know, we tried a lot of towels that didn't work. Yeah. And so we came across these that were actually meant for cleaning glass. I'm like, man, that works so good on the plastic. It just leaves no water, no moisture on there at all. Even when it's a little bit wet, you can wring it out and yeah. still wipe your disc and yeah. it will clean it and dry it. And so it was just the best towel we could possibly find. Yeah. And that's what we started with. And then I've noticed on on your website also you you offer programs where people can actually have their own graphics or put their own sayings on the towel. What uh, was that something that someone brought up or an idea that you guys came up on your own? Well, first the tournament. Yeah, right? the first yeah. tournament mm-hmm. that we that we had, um, they wanted to have their own logo on there, so we're like, okay, let's make it happen. Um, so we do custom logos for tournaments. Uh, we have a minimum 20 item order and um, it gets them a, a good discount. Um, it's about a 30% discount with those. And that way they have a good value product in their player packs and at a more of a wholesale rate. Um, but yeah, so we started doing custom images for tournaments and then also for our wholesalers that want to kind of build their own brand in their, in their stores, they can have a great product, but also have their logo on it. So their local community can support their brand as well. Um, and then we just added embroidery for our individual, um, website sales. Yeah. Just for those one-offs that want to really personalize their flight towel. We have the embroidery. We brought, bought a machine and we have that yeah. going now too. That's cool. And um, and then I saw you have some teams that you sponsor some people. And then I even saw you had uh, Trash Panda and Robbie C uh, with their brands on there. That's pretty cool little uh, partnership. Um, yeah. yeah, that's fantastic. I love the towels for sure. And these are like what they would call, like similar to what they call, like someone says you got to get a golf towel. I'm assuming this is similar to what like a ball golf towel guy has or a little bit different. Uh, when I was playing ball golf, yeah, it would, it would be this size. It's that 16 by 24. Okay. That's our junior. And you know, and, and they all had the grommet right here, but I didn't care cause I was hanging it off a cart. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that's ball interesting. Golf's different. but yeah, this is a disc golf towel. So that's the difference. Cause it, 
Made for disc golfers by disc golfers. No, that's what I was. I just remember. (laughs) uh, I was looking at somebody's tower. They said, "Yeah, we just we finally put them on this golf towel material." And I didn't know what that he meant by the golf towel material. But Mm. it seems like that with this this waffle you mentioned would work much better on plastic on the discs. So that's great. All right. Well, that's great. I love learning about the products, and that's awesome. And like I said, I sent to you early before with all my guests, I like to ask them five questions to get to know you guys a little bit more. And if you guys are ready, I, we can jump right into those. Okay. Sure. All right. All right. So, all right. So, and both, the, I can want answers from the two of you if they're separate answers. That's perfectly fine. So, but tell me, what are you guys learning right now? Um, for me, uh, I'm learning more about marketing um, partnerships and what those look like, um, especially with uh, bigger promotions, like with the Disc Golf Pro Tour. I'm learning kind of the ins and outs of international selling, um, what that, how that impedes or helps um, our company. Um, always learning how to be, to be okay with being uncomfortable and continuing to learn. Uh, yeah, what was the I biggest thing with with uh, working internationally? What was the was there any surprises or things you didn't expect? Um, I'm still kind of in that process, so we'll see. I don't know. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing so far was just a matter of, um, you know, kind of figuring out where our bottom line is and and how to still be able to offer our products at a rate that we can that will help wholesalers internationally, but also allow us to stay um, good as a business. <laughs> yeah, it's hard because we do make all these products by hand. We don't yeah. have machines just cranking these out. And so it, it makes it a little more difficult, you know, when you're trying to do pricing for a distributor. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess a big part of that was learning and, and developing a distributor <laughs> pricing that would work for our company and for their company. Um, because we also sell on Amazon too. And so, yeah, just, just kind of figuring that out for our company was kind of a learning curve. Um, also, you know, what all goes into um, negotiation, you know, on such a big partnership. Um, I'd say the same thing for the Disc Golf Pro Tour. Um, it was exhilarating, but, you know, just like, learning all the different pieces that kind of can go into that and um, still in the process of learning that as well, because we're still, you know, sending product to them and getting things put in. And um, yeah, it's it's all just, it's just all new and and learning that and being okay with it. I think. Is there any plans to uh, have them not handmade, but have someone manufacture them for you? No, no, no. No, I think, you know, to us, it that's what makes our company different, unique, mm-hmm. and valuable. You know, um, we are making products handmade from the United States. And anyone that supports our, our company is supporting other disc golfers mm-hmm. doing what they love and, and having a business in the disc golf community. So, um, yeah, I don't know that we would ever do that. We would probably move into hiring people before mm-hmm. we ever have manufacturing just automated. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. What are you learning, yeah. Scott? Um, let's see. What I'm working on right now and learning is how to be more efficient with uh, what we use from the disc. And I, I know mm-hmm. we're already pretty efficient because we take discs that usually can't even be thrown on the disc golf course legally because uh, they're overweight or defective, warped, things like that, yeah. warped. Um, but, you know, it's we, we use the fobs, we use the centerpiece, uh, and I send any of those scraps back to Jesse, but I was generating a lot of waste from just cutting the disc itself because it's a quarter-inch router bit that I use. So that's quite a bit when you're cutting up hundreds and thousands hundreds. and thousands of discs <laughs> at this point. <laughs> so I've uh, I've created a pretty good system to uh, collect all of that and uh, collect it so it's clean. So Jesse over at Trash Camp Panda mm-hmm. can actually recycle that for us too. So yeah. I I'm really working on using 100% of that disc and making sure nothing goes to waste. Yeah. 
And so uh, I've, I've just been learning some new processes on how to collect all of that off of our machinery. But I, I, never thought, I, I never thought about it, but that makes perfectly sense. The uh, partnership between you and Jesse, how you would have give him your waste and it becomes his material to create his discs. That's, that's amazing. Um, and and that's something I should have asked earlier, but how, how, so I apologize for jumping back a little bit, but sourcing your discs, you say, you mentioned, you mentioned you have, you use a lot of overweight discs. Did you reach out to manufacturers and say, Hey, you guys have a bunch of discs you're sitting on that I could use. How was that process? Uh, in the start, yeah, I started reaching out to manufacturers and be like, hey, uh, I'm Scott with Flight Tell. I cut up your discs for our products. And <laughs> hey, if, you they, to us. <laughs> if they would respond, what? they were like, what are you talking about? You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so in the start, we were, we were hitting them up. And at this point, we have manufacturers that contact us yeah. quite often with uh, lots that can't be used. That, yeah. uh, because... I mean, it, it puts them in a hard place too. You know, if they're a manufacturer that has all these discs and they get warped because they were improperly stacked or they happen to be overweight, you know, what are they going to do with them? They right. can regrind them, but that's a process. You know, you got to dry that plastic back out. That's that's kind of a big deal. It's a lot easier that's to funny. just make some money off them still and then just pitch them off to us. And so, yeah, we got some we've got some really good relationships. Yeah, good. Where we get a lot of our discs. Good. And we save a lot of discs from landfills and getting reground and all that. They still get to live a life in disc golf. That's right. Well, <laughs> and even people who want to send in their own discs can do that. And then mm-hmm. we can cut those for those customers too. Yep. You know, so if they have like a special disc that they want to mm. always have, they can send it in, get their own flight towel, and then they have it in their pocket, you know, with them mm. at every round. Yeah, that's cool. I hadn't so, thought of that. We even do that too. All right, next question. How has failure shaped your life? Our life. Okay. I didn't know if it was like business related. It could be any, it could be any business related, <laughs> personal, whatever. I think we're kind of very similar on this. But um, for me, I think that um, failure is really just an opportunity for learning and adjusting and shifting. Um, and so even when... <coughs> Sorry. Even when mistakes are made, um, you just learn from them and you adjust uh, so you can be successful moving forward. And um, yeah, we kind of talked about that a little bit. It's like, yeah, there is no real failure for me. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes things don't work out, but that just means something else will. Something else will, (laughs) and you have to try it a different way, you know? And I just. My mind works like that. I'm like, oh, well, that didn't work. Cool. Got that out of the way. That's not a failure. That was time well spent because that didn't work. Yeah. Now I'm going to go this way at it. You yeah. know? No, we talk a lot yeah. about how things went really great and successes in the business. But was there ever a point in time where you guys looked at each other and thought, I'm not sure this is going to work? I think the only time that we've had kind of like, maybe we shouldn't have done mm-hmm. that was really goes into, you know, um, getting loans and stuff, you know, getting money capital to like boost in a different direction. Yeah. Um, and I think it comes back to the way we started was very incrementally, you know, rolling things back in. And then the moment we went to be like, okay, we'll go get this, this little bit of uh, credit. Paying that back was painful. I was like, like oh, that didn't feel good at all. You know, so I, I think I think that was the only, we're like, we're not doing that ever again. Yeah. Okay. I mean, we have the option, but we're like, oh, that just didn't feel good. No. Yeah. That was like year four. Year we're like, four. Oh yeah. A little bit of operating capital. Sure. That would be nice. I'm like, wait, no, I don't want to pay that back. No, I just didn't, it didn't feel good. So, um, so. I think that's really the only time we were like, maybe we won't do that again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Number, question number three. Who do you know that I should know? Well, you already know Jesse. Yeah. <laughs> Trash Panda. We're like, oh, we should definitely know Jesse. Um, I would say it. Well, I guess it depends on what. Like, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? Yeah. <laughs> like, Who do just, we know? Is there, and it could be, it could be anybody that, uh, not even someone that I could reach out to, but just anybody that you're like, you should get to know this person because they've affected my life or if they've helped me or motivated me or helped mentor me. Um, is there anybody mm. off the top of your head that you thought, man, you should, you should really reach out to this person and, and start a conversation? I know who I want to talk about. I don't know. Okay. You talk. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I would say um, one of those people for me and who I think is an extremely valuable resource for anyone wanting to build their own brand or get into YouTube videos and social media and, and really building a business out of marketing themselves would be Robbie C. Robbie C. Disc Golf. Um, he's one of our players and I'm just always impressed with his ability to grind through and learn and move. Um, which of course I think is a definition of a very successful entrepreneur. Um, and he's just, he's moved past those mistakes and, and has learned and grown. And so he's just such a great resource that we use for our team. We have um, 58 uh, sponsored players on our team. And so for our team, it's always more of a marketing, uh, a brand building together. And that's how I treat our team and, and vice versa. And so he's always just a, such a great, he's part of our team. He's also such a great resource because he's done the work and he continues to push himself in such a powerful way, making new partnerships and growing more that mm -hmm. I would say he's probably one of the people I'm like, <clears throat> that's an awesome dude. He knows his stuff and he's learning it and he's pushing himself and, and it's successfully, it, it's showing his success is showing because of it. Cool. I, I would pro I'd go with Robbie C as well. I yeah. mean, okay. It would be Robbie C or Jesse, just or Jesse, because I yeah. love absolutely love what both of them are doing. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. those are our two. Like he's a great guy. I've worked with him a little bit with Clash and some other uh, projects, and he's been on the show before. Yeah, Robbie C is he's a, a very very good guy for sure. Okay, now uh, next, what have you read or watched that I should read or watch? Oh yeah. And again, it doesn't have to be like super inspiration. You know, I'm not looking for, you know, super wonderful, but anything that just like, man, I, uh, yeah, more people I mean, should I, know I gotta, about this. I got to go with my favorite book. And it's, yeah. so it's, it's the art of happiness by the Dalai Lama. And I read mm. this, I've read this book several times and I read it a long time ago yeah. and it just, it just changes your outlook on life a little bit. It's, it's really powerful. Yeah. It, it teaches you to, uh, to have a lot of patience, to have a lot of compassion. And when you have those things, it, it, it makes it so easier to get through life, but it makes it easier to get through anything like growing flight tall as a business. I have a massive amount of patience because of things I learned so long ago from reading that book, you know, that I, I don't, you know, get upset at things very easily. I don't have that knee jerk reaction. I'm like, oh no, we'll get through this. It's, no problem. You know, we'll figure this out. Yeah, we haven't done it, but we're going to watch, yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I think that book and it doesn't come from like a religious aspect or anything mm -hmm. like that, but I think that book is pretty powerful. So that would be Now, is that I something you had recommend. to learn over time or did with to be able to have more patience? Were you, had, were you originally an impatient person and this helped you or were you already kind of a patient person and this just kind of helped I, your journey to be more patient? I would say I was an impatient person and it oh. definitely helped me, you know. And so it was kind of a growth thing where, I mean, I'm assuming right after you read the book, you weren't like automatically a patient person. So it was probably <laughs> no, some, no, 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 some no. growth going on there. <laughs> yeah, it takes many years, but yeah. yeah. Very cool. Um, I I don't remember. I, I know the main title of this book and the concept of the book, um, but it's called Flow. And again, I don't remember the, the author. I was going to grab it before our interview, but I didn't have a chance. But um, really what I loved about this book is it taught, it talks about finding enjoyment in what you're doing, whether it's something that's really not enjoyable. And if it's something you really, because I remember I was, I was in a position at one point and I really did not like this job and it was very depressing. Um, and so I would read that book and, and it would teach me just how to be, more um, finding the beauty in, in, in just the littlest thing, you know, mm. and find and uh, allowing yourself to kind of play little success games. Like how many of these can I get done in this amount of time? Ooh, you know, so it gives you some, a level of um, feeling successful, even in a tough situation or even in a tough job that you just have to do because you have to pay the bills, you know? Um, and so it, it talked a lot about, um, people in concentration camps and they have nothing to live for. So how do they make their life what it is, right? And um, simple things that they would do. And it was 
one quick little story, which I thought was really impactful. It was that they didn't have anything to write with. They don't, you know, nothing like that, but they would go around and they would start a story. Each one would add a little bit more and then they have to remember, they'd have to know what that whole story was and they go all the way around. And that was just one way that they created purpose and enjoyment in their life in such a hard situation. So I thought that was um, just a really powerful lesson to take the best out of what you have, regardless of what that looks like and, and try to make it the best you possibly can. So, yeah. Yeah. So our two books together, you'll <laughs> you're pretty well off, I guess. I, no, yeah. I love it. No, I love it. Uh, it seems like just uh, finding happiness or, so, you know, sometimes you have to kind of like seek out that happiness, uh, seek out that joy. I've read books where, you know, happiness isn't promised to us. You almost have to seek it out, even in, in no matter what your circumstances, find find the, the silver lining. Um, so I love that. Yeah. Okay, so the last question, what have you done that I should do? What's an experience you've had that you think more people should experience? Well, I had always wanted to invent a product and take it to market, so I'm going to say that because oh. it's it's just amazing. Yeah. You know, something that comes from your mind, you create it, it's a physical product, you show it to the world and people dig it and, and they want to buy it and support you. It is such an amazing feeling. So yeah. No. Um, yeah, that's a good one. It's a really good one. <laughs> um, for me, I think I've done a lot of personal growth and I've spent a lot of time on that part of my life. And I think that has put me in the position of really appreciating as much as I can of, of my life as it is. And so I think, you know, anything that's a personal development that can help you grow, help you be happier, help you be more, um, you know, balanced and find a way to enjoy your life as much as you can, I think is really important. So anyone, you know, personal growth, I think it's really important. Um, it also strengthens the mind and it also helps with entrepreneurship because you're, you kind of get those things that, stop you from moving forward, taking care of when you work on that kind of personal growth helps very you cool. to not get stuck. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Thank you. So what are the, what are the, uh, plans for flight towel? Where do you guys see yourself in the next five, 10 years? <laughs> we haven't had that discussion <laughs> recently. Like, oh, we're just in the middle of, of toiling and getting yeah. things done. Yeah. But. I don't know. I mean, every, it seems like every week it's, it's something new that comes up. that's exciting. So I would say in five years, I, I want to just be doing exactly what I'm doing right now. Uh, maybe, maybe an employee or two. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, I'm a little, little leery of the employee <laughs> thing. I was in, I was in management for many, many years. And so to just upper level management. yeah upper level so to just work with uh, fellow owners is quite nice because everybody is responsible for their own part mm -hmm. of the business and you know but yeah I would say five years we would probably have a few employees and uh, yeah. I mean we grow every year yep so yeah it's just that it's that progression of you know that tightening that stretch position that you kind of get into where. It's too much work, but you need to stretch that position until you can bring someone on. And mm -hmm. I think, yeah, if we keep the way that we are right now, probably within five years, we're going to need employees. <laughs> we're going to need some employees. Yeah. yeah. Well, that sounds like one of those yeah. good problems to have, though. So that's that's fantastic. Yeah. Well, thank yeah. you, Scott and Amanda, for being on the show. I really appreciate it. And I, I really enjoyed learning more about the company and, of course, about you guys behind the scenes and what you guys got going on. Um, where can people find? I'm obviously, I know flighttowel.com is your website and they can find you. I've, I found you on Facebook, Instagram, and a little bit on YouTube. So, but what, what's something upcoming that people can uh, start learning about and following your journey? Do you have anything upcoming? Uh, the most upcoming that we have is um, our European distribution that's coming oh, up. We're yep. going to be um, looking for and adding some more players, European players, um, for that uh, growth. Yep. Um, and so, then, yeah, that's our biggest thing right now, probably, uh, is that. And then 
probably a disc golf pro tour. Disc golf pro tour. Yeah. Yeah. Growing that. Growing that a little bit more too. Um, we're also going to be at the Portland Open vending and at BSF mm -hmm. vending. So anyone that's going to those can come up and yep. say hi. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, I look forward um, to seeing that commercial that you put together that you had to scramble and put together. <laughs> <laughs> I shot two. <laughs> two, oh, yeah, two commercials. Yeah. Well. So, wow. Yeah. Yeah. What, awesome. what we did for those commercials was neat too. We used our team. So hmm. I gave them all very specific settings that they had to put their cameras in uh, on their phones, you know, so the resolution was good enough. Yeah. And then I had them all send them in to me, and they were incredibly large files, which <laughs> I didn't really plan on. And so then it crashed my computer a bunch. <laughs> And, uh, but yeah, I was able to use our players in the ads, which is awesome too, because they're yeah. on disc golf network, you know, everybody's seeing that. And then, yeah, yeah that's pretty cool. I love being able to do that. So we're going to be doing more of those and incorporating more of those into our promotion with the disc golf pro tour. Cause they're so nice and a lot, they said, just send us whatever videos you want and we'll keep, you know, putting them through. So we'll have more of our players seem mm -hmm. to be featured as well. Yeah, that's awesome. Good for you guys. All right. Well, thanks again thank so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, good luck on the future. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks so for, having, for us. having us. Yeah, yeah. It's been fun.